sent by the gods to destroy civilization as an act of divine retribution is a widespread theme among many cultural myths. It is best known from the biblical story of Noah, but there are several other famous versions, such as stories of Matsya in the Hindu Puranas, Deucalion in Greek mythology, and Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh among others. Many of the world's cultures past and present have stories of a great flood that devastated earlier civilizations. A good deal of similarity exists between several of the flood myths. The Chronicle of Plato on Atlantis. The original story of the lost island of Atlantis comes to us from two Socratic dialogues called Timaeus and Critias, both written about 360 BCE by the Greek philosopher Plato. There was once so much evil on earth that justice flew into the heavens and the king of the gods decided to exterminate the race of the men. Jupiter's wrath extended beyond his kingdom of heaven. Neptune, his brother of the blue seas, sent the waves to his aid. Neptune struck the earth with his trident, and the earth trembled and shuddered. Very soon, it was no longer possible to distinguish the land from the sea. Under the waters, the nymph snared as contemplated, astonished, forests, houses and cities. Almost image six all the men perished in the water, and those who escaped, lacking food, died of hunger. Egyptian legend says that it was the sun god, Ra, who caused the flood over people on earth. A papyrus of the 12th dynasty, 3000 years old, which is kept in the hermitage of Leningrad mentions the serpent island and contains the following passage. When you leave my island, you will not find it again because this place will disappear under the waters of the seas. Also, this ancient Egyptian document describes the fall of a meteor and the catastrophe that followed. A star fell from the heavens, and the flames consumed everything. They were all scorched, and only I saved my life. But when I saw the mountain of cramped bodies I was about to die, in my grief, it was almost impossible for me to get an exact idea of the geological upheavals that destroyed Atlantis. But the sacred traditions and scriptures of many peoples provide us with a picture of the catastrophe. The Bible contains the story of the Noah's Ark that was saved from the Great Flood. In the Book of Enoch, the patriarch who warned Noah of the impending disaster, before he raised to heavens, we find significant passages referring to the fire that will come from the west, and the great waters to the west. The epic song of Gilgamesh, 4000 years ago, contains a detailed account of the flood and deplores the end of an ancient people. It would have been better if hunger devastated the world, and not the flood. The priests of Baalbek, city of the god Baal, in present-day Lebanon, and where there are three colossal blocks, each with a weight between 1000 and 2000 tons, had the habit of pouring seawater, obtained in the Mediterranean, in the crevice of a rock near the temple, in order to perpetuate the memory of the waters of the deluge, which was said to have disappeared there. The ceremony should also commemorate Deucalion's salvation. To get this water, the priests had to make a four-day journey to the shores of the Mediterranean, and many more back to Baalbek. Andrew Thomas was a ufologist, Freemason and writer. Thomas was born in St. Petersburg. Russia. In 1911 his family moved to Helsinki, Finland, where his father worked as a civil engineer for the Ministry of Defense. In 1912 the Tomas family moved to Vladivostok and then, in 1922, to Harbin, Manchuria. There Tomas went to a school of an English Methodist missionary to learn typing and English. In 1924, Tomas' family moved to Shanghai, China, where he lived for 21 years until 1948, when he moved to Australia. Thomas was a member of grade 32 and Grand Master of the Masonic Lodge of Shanghai. Andrew Thomas lived in Australia from 1948 to around 1966. His extensive interests, especially for the mysteries, meant that he joined the group Australian Flying Saucer Bureau, by Edgar Gerald, created in 1952. Thomas had been thinking about the question of beings from other worlds long before the modern era, which began with the sighting of Kenny Arnold in 1947. In an interview for People magazine, in 1955 he described his role as dedicated to addressing the philosophical and theoretical side of symbols. Following the popularity of von Daniken's book Memories of the Future, Thomas wrote We are not the first, 
which was published in 1971. He then wrote other books, such as Secrets of Atlantis, Shambhala, Oasis of Light, On the Shores of Infinite Worlds, and The Barrier of Time. There are authors who without standing out and without many books manage to become true classics. The Russian Andrew Thomas is a good example of this. In his first written work We Are Not the First, the author tells, through a series of examples, that there have been several civilizations, whose traces have been lost over time and that reached knowledge that we have not been the first to discover. In Secrets of Atlantis, did Atlantis leave deposits of gold and other treasures buried under the pyramids and the Sphinx, as an ancient tradition claims? On the occasion of the International Exhibition of 1964, a capsule containing 44 objects, witnesses of our time, was buried in New York. Our historical predecessors could have acted in the same way, bequeathing future ages objects and manuscripts of inestimable value. Luciano de Samosata, Syrian writer with Greek influences, wrote a very curious story that illustrates the survival in the ancient world of the Great Flood tradition. In Africa, a story spread among the Bushmen mentions a vast island that existed in Western Africa and was submerged under the waters. It is one of the many legends that speak of the disappearance of Atlantis. On the other side of the Atlantic there are also testimonies of a world cataclysm. This should seem natural if it is admitted that Atlantis was linked by commercial and cultural ties, not only to Europe and Africa, but also to America. A mine codex states that the sky approached the earth, and everything perished in a day even the mountains disappeared under the water. The Mayan Dresden Codex graphically describes the demise of the world. The document shows a snake installed in the sky, which spills torrents of water through the mouth. Mayan signs indicate eclipses of the moon and the sun. The goddess of the moon, Lady of Death, presents a terrifying aspect. He holds in his hands an inverted cup from which destructive waves flow. The sacred book of the Maya of Guatemala, the Popol Vuh, provides a testimony of the terrible nature of the disaster. He says that the sound of the flames was heard in the celestial heights. The earth trembled and the objects rose against the man. A rain of water and pitch fell on the earth. The trees swayed, the houses fell to pieces, the caverns collapsed and the day became a closed night. The chill arm ballum of the Yucatan affirms that, in a distant era, the maternal land of the Maya was swallowed up by the sea, while there were tremors of earth and terrible eruptions. Chilam Balam is the name of several books that relate historical facts and circumstances of the Mayan civilization. Written in Mayan language. During the colonial era, most of the writings and vestiges of the Mayan religion were destroyed by the Spanish Catholic missionaries, considering that such vestiges represented pagan influences and therefore harmful for the Maya's catechization. How do you know were the only time Teres been a civilization on our own planet? Could researchers find clear evidence that an ancient species built a relatively short-lived industrial civilization long before our own? What kinds of evidence might then still exist? The best way to answer this question is to figure out what evidence we'd leave behind if human civilization collapsed at its current stage of development.